any chance to revisit anything to do with that. Is that standard procedure for evidence in Bali or is that unusual? Um, no, to be honest, I think it is fairly standard. They, they're a little bit more sophisticated than some places, but they weren't big on fingerprinting. No, obviously and, not. And the family offered to get fingerprint um, experts in from anywhere they chose, like not Australian. And all the family offered to be printed as well because, of course, theories later emerged that Dad was some sort of a drug dealer, which was also what proved absolutely was nonsense. Mm. Can I ask you, Tony, I just want to cover a couple of points. Four customs customs officials present when her bag was first examined in Bali said she tried to stop the bag being opened. And I remember this phrase. She said, I have some, and then stopped. And this was considered really important, wasn't it? Did she demur at having her bag opened, or did she open it voluntarily for them? Um, She didn't really do either. Her brother was dragging it along the ground because the strap had broken. And it it seems that they put it up on a table and said, whose is this? And she was distracted and said, oh, this is mine. And she doesn't deny saying that. I don't think she actually handled it herself. I think they then opened it themselves. But the main customs officer that gave what was alleged to be the most telling evidence at the court, a guy called Gusty Wanati, I've gone through his section many a time and the first time I did it with my wife she gasped several times because I I used several rather choice Australian words to him and he didn't even blink because his English is that poor. Okay so yeah I get get what you're saying. In the end the question most people asked was why would you take drugs into Bali you Mm. know who would you sell them to she couldn't have smoked it all herself. that... That was what got me thinking in the first place it's your classic Coles to Newcastle. Absolutely. She'd been there several times before. Her sister was married to a Balinese guy. She knew the rules. She knew that she knew the whole setup. I mean, I've spent months there over the years now, and every single night you walk the streets of Kuta, someone appears and offers you drugs. Mm. And the marijuana particularly is far cheaper than what you'd pay for it in Australia. So if you were inclined to want to use marijuana, it's readily available. Mm. There was an argument that the Australian gear was better quality, but I tried to track that down and even spoke to marijuana users in Bali who said they'd never heard of this so-called Aussie gold. So that didn't, And they said, look, if you want stronger uh, marijuana, you just smoke more because it's that cheap. So that, that was the first area. There, there was just no logic to why she'd take it now. You know, someone like the so-called Bali 9, well, that's a different scenario altogether. Sure. They're taking massive amounts of heroin out of Bali to Australia where they're going to make significant profit. Yeah, I understand. There was nothing in it for Chappelle to take that in. Tony, but, are you writing the book? Yes, he is. With her? Oh, I see. Oh, no, not with her. Okay. You're no. just writing the next book. Uh, yeah. yeah. She, she did a, a minor... A, well, I don't know that's unfair. She did a... A book with a, a girl called Catherine Benella yes, I remember early that. on called My Story, but it was in the first year of her being locked up, and it, it just failed. It, it was nicely written, but it failed to cover enough of... No, I understand. Tony, uh, good, thank you for talking to us. Good luck with the book. i just got to go because you can hear the music. Claire I want, Matthews. I want to go and have Michelle a beer with Tony. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds fascinating. Everyone, I'm Sharon Brett Kelly, and on behalf of our excellent team, Heidi Mai, welcome to Checkpoint on RNZ National. Tonight, the Christchurch Cathedral Working Group report reveals the Anglican Church would only need to contribute its insurance payout for the historic building to be restored. The vaccination debate continues. We're at a screening of the controversial film Vaxxed, and we tell you how many vaccine-preventable diseases were notified last year. Plus, on the eve of the America's Cup, Oracle skipper Jimmy Spittle picks up where he left off, firing pot shots at Team New Zealand. The latest from Manchester, Donald Trump's son-in-law is investigated by the FBI and Dunedin prepares for another Ed Sheeran concert. RNZ News at 5. Kia ora. Good afternoon. Call Katrina Batanahou.
The Finance Minister is not ruling further tax cuts policies as part of the National Party's election campaign. Under the budget package, people earning less than $52,000 will get an $11 cut, tax cut and those earning more about $20. However, those earning between $24,000 and $48,000 a year and receiving no government support would only be a dollar better off as they lose the independent earner tax credit. Stephen Joyce was asked this afternoon whether National would campaign on any other tax changes. I'm sure we'll talk about tax policy again between now and the election, um, uh, but you know, we'll deal with that at the time, it's just uh, 24 hours after the budget. Stephen Joyce, Parliament sitting under urgency, has passed legislation bringing in the Families Income Package. The Labour Party opposes the bill, but the Greens and New Zealand First voted for it. Forest and Bird says the country needs to start making serious cuts to its greenhouse gas emissions if it wants to honour the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Last year, New Zealand committed to reducing emissions by 11% on 1990 levels by 2030. But the government's yearly inventory released today shows gross emissions were tw in 2015 were 24% higher than in 1990. Forest and Birds climate advocate Adelia Hallett says if global warming is to be kept below two degrees this century, more needs to be done. If we're to hold it at one and a half degrees, which is really, really important for the Pacific Islands especially, but for all of us because it's beyond that the impacts on Antarctica are likely to really kick in. We've got about five years left at the rate we're emitting that's in global emissions, only five years. If we carry on at the rate we're going, we've reached that carbon limit. Adelia Hallett of Forest and Bird. Autism New Zealand has broken its silence and publicly defended vaccinations, saying there is no link to autism. Its chief executive, Dane Duggan, says he appreciates its human nature to try and find a cause for autism, but by making that argument, anti-vaccine advocates are harming not only their own children, but potentially others. Five more screenings of the controversial anti-vaccine film Vaxxed are planned. And you can hear more about this issue on Checkpoint shortly. Dairy owners are backing a police scheme to reward those who dob in people dealing in stolen property from armed robberies. The month-long campaign being run through the Crime Stoppers line offers a reward to people who provide information that leads to a successful prosecution. The spokesperson for the Crime Prevention Lobby Group, Sunny Kaushal, says the police are starting to take dairy owners' concerns seriously by offering rewards, creating a special task force and putting high visibility officers on the streets. Many of the members in the public, they know, uh, you know where to get those cigarettes at cheaper rates or uh, some of those black marketeers. But the reward uh, linked to uh, the information would certainly help uh, in getting into that underbelly. Sunny Kaushal of the Crime Prevention Group. The Prime Minister says he sees no reason to change the blanket ban on prisoner voting despite a renewed court ruling that it breaches human rights. The Court of Appeal has upheld a High Court decision that the 2010 law banning all prisoners from voting is inconsistent with the Bill of Rights. Bill English says he's yet to see the latest ruling, but it's OK for the courts and Parliament to disagree sometimes. That's why we have uh, separation of the powers of Parliament and the courts. Look, if they raise significant policy issues, we'd look at them, but uh, up to now we haven't seen a reason to change the law. The Prime Minister, Bill English. The tennis great Martina Navratilova has joined calls for Margaret Court Arena in Melbourne to be renamed. Ms Court, who won 24 Grand Slam titles in the 1960s and 70s, is now a pastor at Vict Victory Life Church in Perth. She's written an open letter to Qantas expressing her disappointment that its chief executive, Alan Joyce, has become a campaigner for same-sex marriage. She says she believes in the traditional de definition of marriage as stated in the Bible and has no option now but to use other airlines wherever possible. Ms Navratilova, who's openly gay, says Ms Court is on the wrong side of history and the arena named after her should be renamed. It's four and a half past five. 
to sport and the Chiefs are expecting a backlash from the Blues when the two sides meet for the second time in this year's Super Rugby competition in Auckland tonight. The Chiefs won their first encounter 41-26. Chiefs assistant coach Neil Barnes knows the home side will have a point to prove, although he says they're in a similar situation after losing to the Crusaders last time out. Hopefully the quality game will be right up there just like we had last week. And we're obviously not that happy coming second last week. There was probably a 10 minute, 15 period there. If we had it over again, we'd love to and bloody win the game. But we let ourselves down that period. So the fact that we're a little bit grumpy with ourselves and wanting to put a good one out in the paddock, it should be a good hit out for both teams. Neil Barnes. Phoenix forward Costa Barbarousas has been recalled to the All Whites in a 23-strong pre-Confederations Cup squad. Coach Anthony Hudson left him out of the March Cup qualifiers against Fiji, but says he's regained form. Regular skipper Winston Reid is still recovering from knee surgery, so striker Chris Wood will captain the team. Cleveland will play the Golden State Warriors in the NBA Basketball Finals for the third straight year. They clinched the Eastern Conference title series 4-1 by beating the Boston Celtics 135-102 to in Game 5. LeBron James surpassed Michael Jordan to become the highest scorer in NBA playoff history. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, the Oamaru Teapot Races. What could be more steampunk? Not to mention the ideal thing for people who want the perfect cuppa in a hurry. Simone Montgomery explains how, and maybe why, after eight, Country Life goes on a trapping expedition to Banks Peninsula, and we have a sonic tonic dedicated to fakes and forgeries on nights with me, the real McCoy, after the alternative facts at seven on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow, Northland and Auckland. A few showers turning to rain for a time overnight. Coromandel Bay of Plenty, Waikato, Waitomo, Taumira Nui Taupo and Taranaki. A few showers, periods of rain tomorrow, heavy at times with possible thunderstorms about Coromandel and Bay of Plenty, easing to isolated showers from afternoon. Whanganui and Taihepe to Wellington, also Gisborne to Wairarapa. Mainly fine today, occasional rain tomorrow, possibly heavy. Marlborough, Nelson and Buller, rain with some heavy falls, spreading east by evening, clearing tomorrow afternoon. Westland, fine apart from overnight rain. Canterbury and Otago, high cloud today with patchy rain this evening. Rain spreading north tomorrow, easing late morning or afternoon. Southland and Fiordland, occasional rain heavy in Fiordland, clearly early, clearing early tomorrow and fine spells increasing. And the Chatham Islands, fine spells today and a few showers tomorrow. It's seven and a half past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Kia ora, Katrina. We begin tonight in Northland where the doctor at the centre of a vaccination debate has challenged anti-vaccine advocates to look a dying child in the eye and see how they feel. Figures obtained by Checkpoint from ESR today reveal more than 1,700 New Zealanders contracted vaccine-preventable diseases in 2016, including measles, mumps, rubella, whooping cough and hepatitis. A third of these cases were people aged under 19. The debate has resurfaced after Northland Dr Lance O'Sullivan stormed the stage of the controversial film Vaxxed on Monday night, begging people to vaccinate their children. And as Zach Fleming reports, even Autism New Zealand is backing Dr O'Sullivan, saying there is no link between the disease and the MMR vaccine. Tickets were just $6. Around 50 people watched, some for a second time. Some had driven nearly an hour to be there. The tiny theatre in Mangotoroto, a 90-minute drive north of Auckland, population 756, was nearly full. Mostly full of people who'd already made up their minds. I'm shocked that you guys are here, to be honest, because all the um, editors and the people who are in control of the media right through the world are busy doing the ostrich. By ostrich, local Dean Crafts implying the world's media is burying its head in the sand. And it's an ironic comparison to make. It's a myth. Ostriches don't bury their heads in the sand. Ironic because medical professionals and scientists the world over say there is no link between autism and vaccines. 
They say it's a myth. Don't listen to these people because they don't have the evidence to support what they're saying. Dr John Fraser, the Dean of Auckland University's Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences. He's spent 35 years specialising in immunology and infectious diseases. We'll hear more from him in a minute. But first, here's more from last night. I've never seen any good science indicating that vaccines are actually beneficial. Um, and to some extent, I think that they're a little bit of a marketing exercise on behalf of Big Pharma. So. But the world was once inundated with smallpox and polio, it and was. now both have been the, the eliminated. Big, the big question is whether or not that was caused by improved hygiene and improved uh, nutrition and improved living standards, the heavy metals, the preservatives, the... Um, DNA from aborted fetuses that are used and that are made, that you have to carry the virus into the body on, I kind of find it morally unacceptable, um, even if there is some medical benefits to it. If the people who are so fearful of catching things, who are vaccinated, are that fearful and they have such trust that they'll work, what have they got to fear? In fact, the people they don't like, who they say aren't vaccinated, well, won't they just die of things and they won't be there anyway, so the problem's gone, so I mean... What have they got to, what, what's the, what, that's not a good argument. Because some people can't be vaccinated because their immune systems aren't good enough, so they say that we should vaccinate ourselves to protect them. Thank you very much. Well, we live on a planet where shit happens. At the top <laughs> scientists in the Western world not been in integrity and lying and bearing it, um, it has massive implications. When you talk to my friends in, in natural health, we always come up to the whole thing that it's brainwashing. It's like all of society is brainwashed. The sniggers and deep breaths you heard were Dr Fraser listening to those responses. Oh, I, was, I got a bit lost in what he was trying to say. It would be a, a, a monstrous conspiracy. They are not in the pay of the pharmaceutical industry. I'm a parent. I have children. I vaccinated my two daughters because I wanted to protect them against these horrific diseases. He's categorical, unequivocal. The latest meta-analysis uh, in vaccine, it was published in 2014, it looked at 12, uh, uh, 1.2 million children around the world, five co case control studies, showing that there was absolutely no relationship between those children who were vaccinated and who weren't vaccinated and the rates of autism. So it's very clear that there is no association whatsoever. The one point that can't be disputed is that autism is more prevalent than it used to be, but Professor Fraser says that can be easily explained. And so one of the arguments the anti-vaccination lobby has said is that the rates of autism are lower in countries where there's lower vaccination rates, i.e. third world countries. Well, the reality is that third world countries don't have the capacity to diagnose autism. It's a very difficult disease to diagnose. It requires paediatricians and paediatric psychiatrists. Uh, and so unsurprisingly in countries such as third world countries, autism is not seen so much because it's not diagnosed. It may be there, but it's just not diagnosed. And his peers feel the same. Earlier this week, Dr Lance O'Sullivan, New Zealander of the Year in 2014, took centre stage at a screening of Vaxxed in Kaitaia, emotively begging viewers to vaccinate their children. This idea of anti-immunisation has killed children around the world and actually will continue to kill Children. Then outside, afterwards... Come and see the nice. damage that your vaccines have done to nice. these children before you start you talking to me about that. Me. You come and see what damage is done by the you vaccines. Organiser Trisha Cheel that night in Kaitaia responding to Dr O'Sullivan, asking her to visit children infected with measles, mumps or rubella. Fast forward back to last night. The organisers of the event declined repeated requests for interviews. They're the same woman who organised Monday night's event in Kaitaia. They say the media is biased and spreads propaganda and refuse to speak to any reporters unless they watch them watch the movie. I also put what viewers said last night to Dr O'Sullivan. To hear someone say that, hey, look, we live on a world and a planet where shit happens, I mean, like, that, that is just so... That's just so idiotic. I mean, you know, come into come into my culture, come into my community, or go to a community anywhere in New Zealand. Go face go face the parent of a child who's died from meningitis or from pneumonia or from whooping cough, and you tell them that shit happens. And let's see how far, how long you last in their house. Since his stage plea, he's received support from the health minister Jonathan Coleman, the New Zealand Medical Association, and even Autism New Zealand. Given there's no known cause and no known cure, it's human nature to try to find a cause and to try to find a cure. So I understand people looking for that, but 
what they're doing in the process is also potentially harming not only their own children but other children as well in terms of not getting them vaccinated for all the other um, or, or, or for all the diseases that we thought were pretty much wiped out because of the vaccines um, that are starting to come back now. Checkpoint has tried to speak to a New Zealand medical professional who believes vaccines can cause health problems. As yet, nobody has stepped forward. Anti-vaccination spokespeople say the doctors they know of are too scared to speak publicly, even anonymously. There are five more screenings of vaxxed planned for New Zealand. The ticket seller, Eventbrite, has not responded to requests for comment. For Checkpoint, Zach Fleming. And we'll hear more from Dr Lance O'Sullivan after 6 o'clock tonight. The Anglican Church would only have to contribute the money it received in its insurance payout in order for Christchurch's cathedral to be restored. The revelation is contained in the report from the Cathedral Working Group, which Rebuild Minister Nikki Wagner released today. It says the church's $42 million payout could be supplemented by the government and city council funding and that the remaining half of the $105 million cost could be gathered through a fundraising campaign. Maya Burry reports. The half million dollar report was commissioned by the government as a way to break the deadlock between the church, which wants to demolish the cathedral and construct a new one, and heritage advocates who want to save it. The report's findings appear to contradict comments from Bishop Victoria Matthews in an opinion piece this week where she suggests that restoring the cathedral is unaffordable. The new rebuild minister, Nikki Wagner, says the report provides a way forward. The government stance is that we need to have a decision that everybody can agree to. We want an agreed solution. This gives the evidence of one type of solution that we could do. The report, which was presented to church property trustees in December last year, found the outstanding $55 million was an achievable target and could be raised within three to five years. Instead of accepting the report, the church has decided to delay a decision further by waiting until September when the matter will be put to a vote at a meeting of its synod, made up of 200 clergy and elected members. The co-chair of the Greater Christchurch Buildings Trust, Philip Burden, says it is absurd that the church hasn't accepted the report's findings. It is a clean-cut formula that deals with the engineering issues and deals with the fundraising capacity. And uh, the church uh, clearly has full knowledge and has, as of date, found reasons to oppose. Mr Burden says the government needs to use its legislative powers to move ahead with the restoration work outlined in the report. Everybody has bent over backwards to find a practical solution for the restoration of this building and the church sadly has refused to engage and has continued to find reasons to delay, to, to in effect refuse to participate in a recommendation that their own representatives signed off on. In a statement, Bishop Matthews welcomed the release of the report and noted the working group's only task was to look at the possibility of reinstating the cathedral. Meanwhile, a cross-party meeting was held in Christchurch today to discuss how Christchurch MPs could work together to help find a way forward for the cathedral. Another meeting is expected to be held in the coming weeks. In Christchurch for Checkpoint, Maya Burry. Further tax cuts could be on the cards as part of National's election campaign. 24 hours after delivering a $2 billion families package, which includes raising the bottom two tax thresholds, the Finance Minister Stephen Joyce is not ruling out further cuts. Here's our political editor Jane Patterson. Under the budget package, people earning less than $52,000 will get an $11 tax cut each week and those earning more, about $20. However, people earning between 24 and 48,000 a year and receiving no government support would only be a dollar better off as they lose the $10 independent earner tax credit. Labor's Grant Robertson says that's not a tax package Labor can support. What we're making clear by that is that we would support uh, the Working for Families changes, but this is one piece of legislation with one vote at the end, and that vote would vote for $1.9 billion of unaffordable, unfocused and irresponsible tax cuts. We can't support that. The Greens co-leader James Shaw also thinks the tax package unfairly benefits higher income earners. We do think that it's 
that you know that there's a significant tax break for families on higher incomes that that's included in, in this, and that is unnecessary. Uh, and in fact, people who are on high incomes don't want that. They actually want to see that uh, that tax revenue invested in making sure that the people who have been left behind are actually included in the economy. However, the finance minister Stephen Joyce is not ruling out further tax changes under a national government. He was asked whether National would campaign on any other tax changes for higher income earners. I'm sure we'll talk about tax policy again between now and the election, um, uh, but you know, we'll deal with that at the time, it's just uh, 24 hours after the budget. Would you potentially flag any changes? or? It's just too early no. to say, Jane. But um, you're not ruling out any... No, and I've said quite clearly in the budget that if we got more in, we'd like to do more things. Um, there's no doubt about that. It's just a matter under what basis and what would we do. Um, and and you know, we haven't talked about it yet, but that's something that we might talk a little bit more about before the election. We'll just wait and see. The package also contains a boost to the accommodation supplement for about 136,000 families. The budget also contains money to build thousands of new houses in Auckland and about $184 million for social housing. Stephen Joyce admits about 100,000 people will remain under severe housing stress, even though he says some of those people will benefit from the family's package. Labor's Grant Robertson describes the accommodation supplement as an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. If we're not building more affordable houses, if we're not um, building more state houses, if we're not getting more homeless people into emergency housing, you know, there is a housing crisis. The Greens co-leader James Shaw says his party supports higher accommodation subsidies, but he says that could drive rents up and put further pressure on the housing market. The accommodation supplement is only necessary because the housing market is so out of control and because the government has refused to build public housing. And the problem with the accommodation supplement is you're basically taking taxpayer money and you're putting it into the pockets of uh, private landlords. Mr Joyce says research done by the Ministry of Social Development shows landlords did not put rents up when the accommodation supplement was increased in 2005. But he has this message for landlords. I'd counsel them to be very cautious about that. You know, the officials of both MB and uh, MSD are going to keep a very close eye on that sort of activity over the next little while. Um, and you know, obviously we don't want to see that happening and we'd be concerned and we'd take a measure to act if we thought that was the case. What, what can you do, given it is a private market? Yeah, well, we'd, I think the main thing is to look at it really closely and see if it's, it's occurred. The anticipation is that it won't occur, uh, but we will be watching to see if there's any, any sign of it happening. The Families Package legislation has been passed under urgency, supported by the Greens and New Zealand First. However, Labour opposed it, saying voting for the package would be an endorsement of $1.5 billion of unfair tax cuts. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Jane Patterson. The America's Cup in Bermuda is off to an inauspicious start, with tomorrow's opening ceremony and the first day of racing postponed due to high winds. Sunday morning, our time is now the kickoff. But the first piece of cup theatre has been played out with the traditional skippers media conference showing there's still plenty of niggle between the defender and New Zealand. Jimmy Spittle, the skipper of defender Oracle Team USA, has hinted at a rift between Team New Zealand's boss Grant Dalton and his sailors. Yes, it's the cup niggle that we love to hate. And our reporter Todd Nile was at the conference. It's a big production number, the six cup skippers or helmsmen on stage with the America's Cup itself facing the world's media. Though far fewer media than in the past, the half dozen from New Zealand, the biggest global block by far. New Zealand journalists asking the first two questions. Todd Nile, Radio New Zealand. Jimmy, can we dispose of one of those conspiracy theory questions with the defender for the first time racing challenges? Will you be racing every race to win or do you use the opportunity to perhaps manage the outcome of the Challenger series? Well, first of all, it's great to see you, all your Kiwi media back here in the press conference. I've got to say I've missed you guys, um, and I'm certainly looking forward to the days ahead. But the real anti-Kiwi barb he threw later, underlining the long-running niggle between his boss, New Zealander Sir Russell Coots, and Team New Zealand's head Grant Dalton. He was asked, did he agree with Dalton's description of the New Zealanders as the lone wolves? They've always been invited, basically, to every meeting uh, to discuss the future of the event. So I think Grant Dalton's shown he is a lone wolf. Um, I think he's quite correct, and so it's rare for me to agree with him, but I'd have to agree with that. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think he's created that. We've obviously 
wanted them involved. I mean, I've spoke with some of the Team New Zealand sailors and they have a different opinion, but they can't say anything. A split in the New Zealand ranks. Helmsman Peter Burling saw it as mind games. Oh, I think it was a shot at the whole team a little bit, to be honest. Uh, that's something that, you know, that these guys are also, you know, giving a fair bit else away with uh, showing a bit about how much they're, they're sharing with, with Japan. And you know, I think it's something that, that really proves, you know, how great a job our design team and short team have done to be able to keep up with, with that kind of uh, two-boat program. Jimmy Spithill. Jimmy, this is a big moment for your team. A lot of the media conference was about Jimmy. Dean Barker's SoftBank Japan is a sister team to Oracle, sharing technology with the Defender. I asked Barker whether Oracle shared everything or kept something back. Um, you'd have to ask Jimmy that, I think. So I did. For the moment, yeah. See what happens later on. Later on could be in the event that Oracle Team USA ended up facing its sister operation in the America's Cup final, an unthinkable outcome for New Zealand fans. One fan is Peter Lester, a past Cup sailor and now a commentator embedded in Team New Zealand. Lester was watching how Peter Burling managed his first America's Cup media conference. Watch, looking at the eyes of Spittle and, and especially Ben Ainsley, they were looking across at Burling and Burling had uh, a little smirk on his face right through the presser and I thought um, they, they respect him already. So, so look out, I mean the scene is set for an intriguing cup. And intriguing to see whether Oracle continues to use the partial adoption of Team New Zealand's pedal powered hydraulic system. Cue Jimmy on that single bike they've been trialling on the boat. We're going to keep developing and see how it sets up. Yeah, so we'll just have to see how it goes in the competition. So you will be using that bike in racing? You'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> The band in the Cup Village gets an extra day to rehearse. The organisers have a grandstand full of tickets to refund, a reminder that nature and not television schedules still run the America's Cup. In Bermuda, Motehotaka o Tiahiahi, ko Todd Nile Tene. To Dunedin now, where Ed Sheeran has today announced his sixth New Zealand concert. He'll play a third concert over Easter weekend next year at the Forsyth Bar Stadium, making his tour one of the biggest ever in New Zealand. Almost 250,000 are expected to attend his shows, and Councillor Damien Newell says the fact Sheeran has chosen Dunedin should work in the city's favour for other big acts. Oh, we just can't believe it. I mean, uh, I think the most ambitious um, supporter of Dunedin and the most ambitious Ed Sheeran fan wouldn't have thought would sell, sell out two concerts. Um, and to be given the third, it's just an absolutely remarkable opportunity for Dunners. And um, yeah, just can't. <laughs> absolutely unbelievable. What is it about Ed Sheeran that would make them think that another concert for Dunedin would bring enough people? Um, to be perfectly honest, I think it would have been any of the big ones. I mean, we've been we've been close so many times um, with our, with our stadium. I mean, we've had um, we were very very close to Adele for a long time, Katy Perry, and you know we were sort of very very close to getting Bruce Springsteen as well. It's it's not so much uh, the artist. I mean, Ed Sheeran is obviously everyone loves him. I mean, he's just got such broad appeal. But I mean, we also sold um, thirty five thousand tickets to um, Elton John on a Tuesday night. So you know what I mean? It's 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 a wonderful venue, and I think you know um, people travel. I mean, we, we fly to Auckland for concerts, we go to Christchurch for concerts, and people are willing to travel for, for big gigs. And I think this one has just shown that Dunedin is now officially on that, on that roster. Who's coming to these concerts, though, Damien? Is it all kinds of people? Yeah, it's, it's all ages. Well, especially, um, especially this one. Um, Ed Sheeran's just got such broad appeal. I mean, um, I'm, I'm taking my entire family. I missed out on the first concert and was lucky enough to get the second concert only after someone sort of alerted us that there were more t tickets being drip-fed. Drip so, um, but our entire, you know, from 7 to sort of um, 87, you know, they're, they're all coming. I mean, everyone loves Ed. And the other thing is there's a general want to support the stadium and, and support our city. And will Air New Zealand have to put on extra flights? I would say so. Uh, <laughs> I would certainly say so. I mean, the biggest, the biggest problem we have down here is accommodation. Um, we'll get them here, whether they drive or, you know, because we have such a huge catchment, you know, everywhere from Nelson South can drive. Uh, but I think Air New Zealand will have to put on extra flights. And um, obviously there's going to be a lot of couches surfed as well. 
<laughs> and are you expecting a sellout for this third concert? Yeah, it's going to take it's going to take work. There's no doubt about that. I mean, um, you know, selling out three Adele concerts in Auckland is one thing, but selling out three Ed Sheeran concerts in a catchment, you know, a, a wider catchment of sort of you know uh, close to a million over the South Island, maybe. But um, yeah, no, we're going to have to work for this one, and I think uh, everyone's on the right page. I know a lot of people who are coming down for the Easter weekend, you know, um, to shell out an extra hundred and fifty bucks to see him twice is not going to be a big thing if you're here anyway. What should he do while he's in Dunedin? I mean, he's going to be there for, what, at least three nights? Yeah, um, well, that's the thing, and we're just uh, everyone's just coming up with ideas to entertain Ed, and um, you know, from from the students wanting a piece of him, and obviously uh, taking him for a party down Hyde Street. To uh, we are the wildlife capital of New Zealand, so we're going to take him out, sort of whale watching. We're going to take him out to see the seals and the albatross. I mean, Larnet Castle. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot for him to do. Go and see Aaron Moana, maybe put him in the surf. So that's so exciting. Oh, we're just we're just absolutely over the moon, and as as I say, our little city will have a posh rock on, and we'll be ready to party. <laughs> I mean, when was have you ever had three concerts by a superstar like him before in Dunedin? No, and this has been the big thing. Those that were opposing um, the stadium were all, you know, just saying it was a, a, a rugby venue. And the big thing we we said when we were trying to put it together and trying to get get the thing built was, it is a truly multi multi purpose venue. I mean, we've had we've had um, horses in there. We've had drag racing, we've had drifting, we've had um, soccer, we've had rugby league, we've had rugby, and we've had a lot of concerts too. We've had some big ones. We've had um, Fleetwood Mac, we've had Aerosmith, we've had Elton John. Um, so we have had those big concerts, but this is the first big one, and the world will be watching too to see if Dunedin can do this. And the fact that we've sold out two concerts of 40,000 people within sort of two hours... Um, you know, we're here now and we're ready. And Taylor Swift, if you want to come, um, Lady Gaga, if you want to come, you know, uh, we can do it. And we have a huge catchment. Oh, we just can't believe it. I mean... Uh there we go, Dunedin City Councillor Damien Newell. And Air New Zealand has this afternoon announced it will put on an extra 52 one-way flights between Auckland and Dunedin for the Ed Sheeran concerts, as well as a mix of one-way services between Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch and Dunedin. <laughs> Coming up, raids continue across Greater Manchester as the police hunt for possible accomplices of the Manchester suicide bomber. And Donald Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner is under FBI scrutiny. Don't forget you can text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ, Facebook us, Checkpoint with John Campbell, or email checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. And you can watch us online fa on Facebook live at rnz.co.nz slash checkpoint on Freeview Channel 50 and on Face TV Sky Channel 83. But first, here's Katrina Batten with the headlines. The Christchurch Cathedral Working Group wants the building restored. A group, a report by the group tasked with finding a way of breaking the deadlock between the Anglican Church, which wants to replace the cathedral, and heritage advocates who want to save it. The new rebuild minister, Nikki Wagner, says the group recommends the building be restored at a cost of $105 million. Parliament has passed legislation under urgency bringing in the family's income package. The Finance Minister, Stephen Joyce, says further tax cuts may be on the cards before the election. Under the budget package, people on between 24 and 48,000 a year and receiving no government support would only be a dollar better off. Forest and Bird is calling on the country to start making serious cuts to its greenhouse gas emissions if it wants to honour the Paris Agreement on climate change. The government's yearly inventory released today shows gross emissions in 2015 were 24% higher than in 1990. Forest and Bird's climate advocate Adelia Hallett says if global warming is to be kept below 2 degrees this century, the country has about five years before it reaches the pledged carbon limit. Autism New Zealand is publicly defending vaccination, saying there's no link to autism. Its chief executive, Dane Duggan, says that he appreciates its human nature to try and find a cause for autism, but by making that argument, anti-vaccine advocates are harming other children as well as their own. The Prime Minister says he sees no reason to change the blanket ban on prisoner voting, despite a renewed court ruling that it breaches human rights. 
And the Transport Agency says the Y River Bridge on the alternate South Island State Highway route in Marlborough has reopened to the public. That's good news. That's the host of the headlines. I'll be back at six. Kia ora, Katrina. Turning to business news now with Giles Beckford. And the two big media companies, NZME and Fairfax, are not taking the rejection of their proposed merger lying down, Giles. No, good evening to you, Sharon. No, it was to be expected that they would uh, not accept the Commerce Commission ruling that their uh, proposed merger was anti-competitive and not in the public interest. So they filed their papers today. They've basically gone uh, hook, line and sinker, uh, thrown the book and a couple of grenades in at the uh, Commerce Commission, saying that on virtually every reason that it put forward, such as uh, the domination that the emerged entity would have over certain markets, the role of Facebook and Google, the breadth of competition in the media market in New Zealand, uh, and that plurality of voices that the Commerce Commission put so much emphasis on, the lack of the loss of diversity that would occur with the merger. It says on every one of those grounds and more, the Commerce Commission was wrong in fact or, or in law or both. So they've hired themselves a top QC. Uh, and I have to say this is going to become a protracted uh, case. None of these issues are settled easily. It will go to the High Court. There'll be a bit of legal skirmishing to begin with. Uh, some stage, possibly before Christmas, a judge will end up with the case. Uh, that judge will have to appoint a specialist advisor, probably a, uh, an economist to advise them uh, on some of the finer points uh, and then we'll get down to trench warfare in a legal sense uh, as to whether the Commerce Commission overstepped the mark um, and whether in fact the court will decide uh, either to approve the merger and they can actually just make a decision that would overturn the Commerce Commission decision and approve it by themselves or send it back to the Commerce Commission to be reheard. Whatever decision comes out, I have to say this is going to go into next year and the loser will probably go to, uh, to the Court of Appeal and ask for permission to appeal. So expect that the lawyers will do very well and will be tied up for a good part of the next uh, six to 12 months. And one other court case of note today, Giles. Yeah, quite a significant one. This relates to the Ross Asset Management. People will remember that this was the investment uh, company that was run uh, uh, here in Wellington. It was a Ponzi scheme, essentially. The money that came in from new investors was used to pay exorbitant uh, and uh, large returns to original investors. So money in, money out, very little was invested. Uh, of course, Mr. Ross uh, went to jail for, uh, has gone to jail for more than 10 years on this case. The Supreme Court has decided that fictitious profits that were paid to one investor should be returned to the liquidators of the, uh, of the fund uh, and they can keep their original money, but that uh, the money which was basically other people's investments uh, that had been given to them should go back. Now, the person who has fought this one all the way through to the Supreme Court, so this is a definitive ruling. Uh, it sets a clear line in the legal sand on issues such as this, and no doubt will be cited for years to come. So what's happened on the markets today, Giles? A, a pretty ho-hum lacklustre day, Sharon. The top 50 index for shares up a rather meagre 7 points. 7.442 is the closing level. The New Zealand dollar, 70.2 US cents and 94.4 Australian. Thank you very much. That's Giles Beckford, our business editor. Raids have continued across Greater Manchester as the police hunt for possible accomplices of the Manchester suicide bomber, Salman Abadi. Eight people are now in custody in relation to this week's terror attack at the Manchester Arena, which killed 22 people. The police are still trying to establish whether Abadi was part of a wider terror network. From Manchester, the BBC's Mark Easton has the latest developments. This evening, the police hunt for Salman Abadi's bomb factory took a new turn. The search of a house in Wigan suddenly escalated with the discovery of suspicious items and the bomb squad were called to the scene. Local families were evacuated as a robot, often used to defuse roadside bombs in war zones, was deployed on a residential home in Greater Manchester. I share a wall with, that, with the guy who was arrested. If there's something inside and my valuables get destroyed... And You're literally in the neighbouring room? Yeah. 
uh, I didn't expect that you know, something of this sort can happen so close to us. Uh, it is really shocking. Police have described their investigation as fast moving. This morning, as the country stood in silence, armed police officers were shouting at residents in central Manchester to take cover after reports of a suspect package in a block of flats. There was all the armed police officers in the middle of the grass just squatting down and um, there was just shouting at everyone telling them don't go near the road. Can you move out of the way, please? I panicked because my daughter was in the school that's just there. The first instance is I need my child. The city is jittery as counter-terrorism chiefs desperately try to track the movements of Salman Abedi. This is what the search for a bomb factory looks like. A tip-off, an address, a raid, and on this occasion, an arrest. But the search for that factory still goes on. This raid did not produce the lead they'd hoped for, but the investigation is understood to be making real progress. Two arrests were made in Manchester early today, and there was a linked swoop on a property 75 miles south in Nuneaton late last night, where another man was arrested. Eight men are now in custody in connection with the arena bombing. I want to reassure people that the arrests that we have made are significant, and initial searches of premises have revealed items that we believe are very important to the investigation. Police and counter-terrorism officers are piecing together a picture of Salman Abedi's last movements. It's understood he'd recently left Manchester for Tripoli in Libya, returning to the UK four days before the attack via Istanbul and Dusseldorf airports. Police think in the hours before the bombing, he may have been at a property in Granby Row near Piccadilly railway station and a short distance from the Manchester arena where the bomb exploded. Somewhere he'd phoned his mother and said, forgive me, according to a Libyan anti-terrorism official. But who else did he talk to? Where else had Abedi been? Forensics, CCTV, traffic cameras, interviews, every conceivable method for tracking Abedi's movements is being pursued. We have been overwhelmed with support from members of the public and I'd ask for patience uh, to continue from our local communities here in Greater Manchester as we carry out those searches and this investigation. There are nagging questions, though. Abedi was known to security services. There had been warnings about his radicalization. Why wasn't he stopped before he carried out his murderous attack? Since 2013, 18 plots have been thwarted, five since the Westminster attack in March. Could, should this one have been prevented, too? Mark, Eastern and Manchester, as investigators continue to search for co-conspirators in the Manchester terrorist bombing, a diplomatic row has broken out between the US and the UK over the leaking of sensitive police evidence. At the NATO leaders' meeting in Brussels, the British Prime Minister told the US President that the investigation was being put at risk, and so was the trust between the two countries. The ABC's Lisa Miller reports. Theresa May and Donald Trump sat side by side in the sun, waiting for the traditional leader's photo to be taken. They talked far from the reach of any microphone, but the British Prime Minister had already flagged the pointed message she planned on delivering. We have a special relationship with the USA. It is our deepest uh, uh, defence and security partnership that we have. Of course, that partnership is built on trust. And part of that trust is knowing that intelligence can be shared confidently. And I will be making clear to President Trump today that intelligence that is shared between law enforcement agencies must remain secure. The British are furious that critical police information was leaked and they believe US intelligence officers were the source. In a statement, Mr Trump vowed to prosecute the leaker, calling it deeply troubling, and he urged NATO leaders to focus on defeating the terrorists. It was a barbaric and vicious attack upon our civilization. All people who cherish life must unite in finding, exposing, and removing these killers and extremists. And yes, losers. They are losers.
Brian Lord, Britain's former Deputy Intelligence Director, said the disclosures were a distraction police did not need. This was not the Americans' intelligence to leak to their press. Um, to do so was totally uh, was, uh, is inexcusable um, and, as I say, just creates a distraction from the investigation and damages intelligence sharing relationships at a time when they need to be at their strongest. In the initial days after the bombing, police appeared to struggle to grasp the extent of the network, but Chief Ian Hopkins says they're making progress. Authorities have revealed that 18 terrorist plots have been thwarted in the UK since 2013, five of those since the Westminster Bridge attack in March. Police are under pressure to explain why this one was not. Donald Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner is under FBI scrutiny as part of the Russian investigation, according to US media. Reports say investigators believe he has relevant information, but he is not necessarily suspected of a crime. The FBI is looking into potential Russian meddling in the presidential election and links with Mr Trump's campaign. Trump has described the situation as the single greatest witch hunt of a politician in American history. But Mr Kushner's lawyer says his client will cooperate with any inquiry. The BBC's David Willis is in Washington. At a time when Donald Trump's faith in certain members of his inner circle is thought to be waning, the influence wielded by members of the first family is on the ascent. At the age of 36, Jared Kushner is the president's closest advisor. Jared Kushner is reported to have caught the attention of the FBI because of his meetings with Russia's ambassador to the US, Sergei Kisiliak. He's also thought to have met with the head of a Russian bank that was subject to sanctions imposed by the Obama administration. Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, is under... Since it was reported last FBI week by the Washington Post that a senior member of the Trump administration had been drawn into the Russia inquiry, this city has been agog FBI with rumor and speculation. To its investigation into Russia. Yes, definitely. The person that we were referring to last week is Jared Kushner. We have done more reporting to lock down that that person is... Jared Kushner. It was Donald Trump's former national security advisor Michael Flynn who was seen as the prime focus of the FBI investigation. He was forced to resign after making misleading statements about the extent of his ties to the Russian ambassador Kisiliak. The suggestion that Jared Kushner might also have information of interest to the FBI is significant because it potentially places the Russia inquiry not only at the doorstep of the White House but in the Trump family circle itself. Responding to the allegations, Mr Kushner's lawyer, Jamie Gorlick, said in a statement Mr Kushner previously volunteered to share with Congress what he knows about these meetings. He'll do the same if he's contacted in connection with any other inquiry. There's no collusion. Uh, Russia is fine. But whether it's Russia or anybody else, my total priority, believe me, is the United States of America's. President Trump has denied any suggestion of collusion between the Kremlin and his campaign. But as it grows in size and scope, the Russia inquiry threatens not only to dominate the headlines here, but to overshadow the legislative agenda of this nascent administration. David Willis reporting from Washington. An education ministry botch-up has dashed an overcrowded Kurdish hope of getting a brand new school and sparked an internal investigation. Te Kura or Matapihi got the green light for a ministry-funded rebuild more than two years ago, but now it's been told that was a mistake. The school is teaching children in its library and a computer room because it doesn't have enough classrooms. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen filed this report. Te Kura or Matapihi is a full immersion primary school of about 150 children just outside of Tauranga. For the past two and a half years, it's been working with an architect and its community to plan a rebuild of their 103-year-old school. The Kura's Tumuaki, Tui Yeager, says everything was on track until last week. We've just found out recently from the Ministry that no, there is no rebuild. So, as you can imagine, we're not very happy with that because the classes that we've got are all substandard and we've got an increasing role. Did they give a reason as to why that's not happening? What we've been told is that it was actually a mistake. The chairperson of the school's board of trustees, Carlo Ellis, says the board and Fano were severely disappointed when they got the news. Oh, there was tears and uh, quite a lot of quivering voices and 
I mean, we've got a really respectful group of people on our board, so it wasn't a matter of yelling, but certainly, certainly there was some raw emotion coming through. Carlo Ellis says he's mystified why the school has been let down when the ministry's own figures show it desperately needs more classrooms. Te Kuro Matapihi is number one in overcrowding for the Bay of Plenty. So for us it's a real mystery is that here we are, we feel like we're delivering on the number one strategy for the Ministry of Education in terms of Māori medium development and we're getting told we're not getting a rebuild and at the same time we are the most overcrowded school in the Bay of Plenty. Tui Yeager says the only bright spot is that the Ministry agrees the school does need more buildings. We are in a deficit of three classes but we've only just found that out probably two weeks ago where we should have, if they weren't going to do the rebuild, probably found out, but we've only just found out last week that it's not going ahead. So, yeah, it's sort of up in the air at the moment. We're waiting to see what the next steps are. The Education Ministry says it's apologised. It says the correct processes were not followed and no approval had been given for the rebuild. It says it's carrying out an internal investigation to find out what happened, and in the meantime, it will develop a property plan for the Kura in the next three months. For Checkpoint... John Gerritsen. Jaden Lee Strubent had only been out of prison for five weeks and was on parole when he jumped his back fence, stomped on his elderly neighbour and sexually violated her. At only 19 years of age, Strubent had spent more time inside prison than outside since his 17th birthday. Today, he was sentenced to life with a minimum non-parole period of 17 years for murdering 69-year-old Kun Xiu Tian. Justice Lang also sentenced Strubent to preventive detention for the sexual violation charges, meaning he'll only be released when he can prove he is no longer a threat to society. Our Auckland court reporter Edward Gay filed this report. Jaden Lee Strubent attacked his frail 46 kilogram neighbour in broad daylight while she was gardening. The Crown Prosecutor David Johnston said Strubent had used an overwhelming level of force, throttling her and pushing her to the ground. With Ms Tian on the ground, this offender stomped on her head, uh, causing the injuries that eventually killed her. He then sexually violated her twice and his DNA was found at the scene. Strubent then set about ransacking the house, stealing an iPad, cash and her daughter's watch. He perpetuated his attempt to avoid detection by uh, using rags uh, and a cleaning product uh, to seek to remove forensic traces. Miss Tian's daughter, Christine Wei, said she still remembers her mother waving and smiling as she and her husband left their Tiaratu home for work on the morning of January 15 last year. She said when they got home that afternoon, she found her mother's body. Miss Wei described Strubent as a monster from hell who not only had killed her mother, but also her future. Miss Tian's son-in-law, Jerry Wang, said up until that moment his life had been perfect. He and his wife lived in a happy home with his mother-in-law, but that all changed. He said since then he and his wife haven't been able to live in their home. Strubent's lawyer Emma Priest described the crime as a burglary gone wrong. She said Strubent came from a dysfunctional family and had been subjected to physical abuse. He'd spent time living on the streets and had used drugs and alcohol from an early age. It is submitted that had Mr Strubent been offered the stability, love and opportunities of a normal home environment, he would not have committed this offending. Miss Priest asked Justice Lang not to impose the crushing sentence of preventive detention, but Justice Lang said mental health reports before the court showed Strubent posted an extremely high risk of reoffending. You have no insight into what you have done or the damage you have caused. You appear to have no interest in atoning for your conduct or rehabilitating yourself. The judge said one of the report writers found Strubent had little remorse for the victim, saying the process had been tough on him and his family. Justice Lang said Strubent needed an incentive to change, and preventive detention for the sex crimes could do that. As Strubent left the dock, he swore and said he couldn't have asked for a better sentence. Outside court, Detective Senior Sergeant Roger Small said Strubent didn't warrant a thought. Many of our officers, some who have been in the police for many years, were shocked, appalled and upset by the extreme violence suffered by Madame Tien. Detective Sarah Cato read a statement from the family thanking the community for their support. The numerous flowers and cards have warmed their hearts and encouraged them to move forward. They are satisfied that their mother 
is now resting in peace. She said they were happy with the sentence. Mo te o te ahi ahi ko Edward Gayaho. New Zealand's greenhouse gas emissions keep on growing and are at a level that is a far cry from the, what the country has committed to under the Paris Agreement. Last year, New Zealand ratified the Paris Agreement on climate change and committed to reducing emissions by 11% on 1990 levels by 2030. The government has just released its greenhouse gas inventory, the official annual estimate of all human-caused emissions and removals in New Zealand. Kate Gudsell reports. According to the yearly inventory, this country's gross greenhouse gas emissions in 2015 were 24% higher than 1990 levels. Forest and Birds climate advocate Adelia Hallett says New Zealand needs to be making serious and deep cuts now if it wants to make that 2030 target of an 11% reduction and keep global warming to well below 2 degrees this century. If we're to hold it at 1.5 degrees, which is really, really important for the Pacific Islands especially, but for all of us because it's beyond that the impacts on Antarctica are likely to really kick in. We've got about five years left at the rate we're emitting that's in global emissions. Only five years. If we carry on at the rate we're going, we've reached that carbon limit. Ms Hallett goes around the country talking to communities about climate change and says that it's more and more on people's radars and weather events this year were a taste of what the future could hold. We're already seeing massive impact both on nature and on the human world. When we see the people of Edgecombe, for example, you know, look at those pictures. How can you not be moved by that? And how can you not be a bit afraid when you see that that's what's happening so quickly to people just like us? You know, it, it, it could be any of us this is happening to. Agriculture and energy are the two sectors which contribute the most emissions here. Between 1990 and 2015, agricultural emissions increased 16%, largely due to a jump in dairy cow numbers and a five-fold increase in the use of fertiliser, which contained nitrogen. Pollution levels did reduce 0.1 per cent between 2014 and 2015 when agricultural production fell because of drought conditions and lower milk prices. A policy fellow at Motu Economic and Public Policy Research, Catherine Lining, says this fall offset growth in energy emissions. We can't really rely on the weather to deliver a low emission future. And what this is suggesting is that New Zealand needs a more integrated policy framework that's actually sending clear and predictable signals for low emission investment and that's going to drive innovation by our businesses, land sector, you know, researchers and communities. So we need more of a deliberate approach to reducing our emissions and putting us on that low emission trajectory. Emissions from the energy sector increased nearly 37% as a result of more vehicles on the road and manufacturing using fossil fuels. A researcher at the Morgan Foundation, Paul Young, says the country is heading in the wrong direction and the government needs to take the lead in turning that around. Well, if we look at transport in particular, given that it's probably of most concern here, we should be looking at emission standards on vehicles. We should certainly be looking at where we're investing our money and putting more into public transport, particularly in Auckland. Next decade, New Zealand will have to buy carbon credits off a yet-to-be-developed market in order to meet its Paris commitment. The current spot price for carbon is a very modest $16 per tonne. But government predictions have put the price at around $150 in the future and there's talk internationally of a price of around $300 per tonne. This could mean the country is paying billions of dollars. Mr Young says the government is not taking the problem seriously enough. I can't really understand that when you consider the kind of sums of money that are, are being thrown around to have to buy a way out if we don't reduce our emissions, not to mention the huge moral issue of climate change. The climate change minister, Paula Bennett, was not available to be interviewed, but released a statement saying emissions have stabilised while the population has grown. She says the country needs to continue its work programme to ensure it meets the Paris Agreement target. For Checkpoint, call Kate Godsell, 10A. The first twin panda cubs born in captivity this year are reported to be strong and healthy after passing the critical one-month mark at the Chengdu research base in China. 
And if you're watching us online or on Facebook Live, you'll want to see these pictures. The male cubs who weighed just 104 and 110 grams when they were born now weigh in at 990 and 981 grams. They spend 80% of their day sleeping in their shared incubator with keepers monitoring their body temperature. First time mother Gigi gave birth to the twins on April the 24th, but she was so scared to see them she refused to breastfeed them. Them. The keepers decided to replace breast milk with formula and then after some gentle coercing they trained Gigi to breastfeed. The giant panda is no longer endangered but remains threatened with a population isolated to 33 clusters around the world. Lots of feedback coming in now on the vaccination debate. Would the anti-vaxxers be prepared to stand beside the bed if a baby is struggling to breathe through a coughing bout caused by whooping cough? I did when I was a paediatric nurse. It's scary and heart-wrenching. To say we live in a world where shit happens is true. It's also callous. That's from Leanne in Wellington. Uh, this from Monica. How can people who had never seen this movie even have an opinion? I have though, and nobody in the movie does ever advise anyone not to vaccinate. It's about a fraudulent vaccine study released by the CDC in the US and the request for more safety studies and safer vaccines. What on earth is wrong with that? Don't we all want the best for our loved ones? And this from Chris, I cannot listen to supposedly intelligent people sprouting rubbish about the alleged dangers of vaccinations. Just look at sub-Saharan Africa and see how many children's lives have been saved by vaccinations. Any parent who does not vaccinate their children in New Zealand should be charged with endangering their child's life. That's from Chris. And another one, I cannot believe that this is still an issue in the 21st century. Anyone who has ever seen a child with polio or mentally affected by measles would not hesitate to have their child vaccinated. RNZ News at 6. Ngamihi Nui, good evening. Ko Katrina Batanaho. The Finance Minister is not ruling further tax cut policies as part of the National Party's election campaign. Yesterday's budget gives people earning less than $52,000 an $11 tax cut from next April, while those earning more than more will get about $20 more. However, those earning between $24,000 and $48,000 a year and receiving no government support would only be a dollar better off as they lose the independent earner tax credit. Asked today whether National would campaign on any other tax changes, Stephen Joyce said National was likely to talk about tax policy again before the election. He said he'd, it, it would like to do more if it has, has the, the fiscal headroom. Parliament this afternoon passed legislation bringing in the family's income package that was the centrepiece of the budget. A law expert says a court of appeal decision upholding a high court ruling that a prisoner voting ban is inconsistent with the Bill of Rights should raise a red flag for all New Zealanders. Up to 2010, only prisoners jailed for three years or more were denied the right to vote, but Parliament then passed new legislation stripping all prisoners of the right. Andrew Geddes of Otago University says some people might be dismissive given the cases about prisoners voting, but a wider issue is at stake. It's not a privilege that you earn. Everyone has it because they are New Zealanders. And if prisoners can have their right to vote taken away simply because we don't like them, that's inconvenient or whatever, then everybody's rights are at stake. You either have rights or you don't. And if you think rights are important, you have to think they're important for everyone. Andrew Geddes of Otago University. A teenager who stabbed a West Auckland dairy owner to death has been released from a youth justice facility. The boy, who's now 16, was serving a sentence of four years and six months for the manslaughter of 57-year-old Aaron Kumar in 2014. He's been free since January, but the parole board only released its decision today after seeking legal advice. The boy's been attending school since the beginning of the year and the board says he's doing very well. Because of this, it says it no longer needs to monitor him, although he'll be subject to some special conditions until June 2019. The boy, who was 13 when he committed the crime, has been granted permanent name suppression by the High Court. The Pentagon has confirmed that 105 Iraqi civilians were killed in an American airstrike in the besieged city of Mosul in March, but eyewitnesses say the toll was much higher. American forces were targeting two Islamic State snipers, 
but dozens of civilians in the same building were caught up in an explosion. Our Washington correspondent Nina Maria Potts reports. U.S. Central Command was trying to hit the snipers with precision-guided munition after a request from Iraqi County Terrorism Services. But their strike ended up triggering explosives ISIS militants had hidden in the building. The ensuing explosion caused the building to collapse, killing civilians on the lower floors. The U.S. has confirmed 105 civilians were killed as a result of the strike, although eyewitnesses place the number even higher. The Pentagon expressed condolences to the victims but defended the strike, saying U.S. forces could not have known civilians were in the building. Nina Maria Potts, RNZ News, Washington. An overcrowded Tauranga school has been told a long-planned rebuild was an education ministry mistake. The ministry is investigating why Takura or Matapihi was led to believe it would be rebuilt. Carlo Ellis, who chairs the school's board of trustees, says he's mystified why it's been let down when the ministry's own figures show more classrooms are desperately needed. We feel like we're delivering on the number one strategy for the Ministry of Education in terms of Māori medium development and we're getting told we're not getting a rebuild and at the same time we are the most overcrowded school in the Bay of Plenty. Carlo Ellis, the ministry has apologised and says it will develop a property plan for the Kura in the next three months. A report from the Christchurch Cathedral Working Group has found the Anglican Church would only have to contribute money from its earthquake insurance payout in order for the re ruined building to be restored. The government commissioned report was publicly released today. Maya Burry reports. The working group was tasked with finding a way to break the deadlock between the church, which wants to replace the cathedral, and heritage advocates who want to save it. It says the church's $42 million payout could be supplemented by government and city council funding, and fundraising could meet half of the $105 million cost. The report's findings appear to contradict Bishop Victoria Matthews, who suggested this week that restoration is unaffordable. In a statement today, Bishop Matthews notes the group's only task was to look at the possibility of reinstating the cathedral. This is Maya Burry. It's five past six. The sport and the hard work has paid off for Wellington Phoenix forward Costa Barbarousas, who's been recalled to the New Zealand football squad for the build-up to the Confederations Cup. Barbarousas was left out of the World Cup qualifying matches against Fiji in March, but All Whites coach Anthony Hudson has recalled him to the 23-man squad. Barbarousas has welcomed his, his reselection. It's great to be back involved now and um, you know, I just want to show what I can do again now and I think I had a, a good reaction to the last camp. Um, towards the end of the season my form was good so I think you know, I've deserved that and it's, it's come from hard work and I've just got to continue that. Costa Barbarousas. The Blues' first five, Piers Francis, says his side has a point to prove against the Chiefs in tonight's Super Rugby derby at Eden Park. The Chiefs won their last encounter 41-26 and the Blues' playoff chances are next to non-existent. But Francis says his side's determination remains. We owe these, these boys one. Um, they're coming up to, to our house, uh, our last home game, so um, you know we're fizzing to go and um, we believe we prepare pretty well on a short turnaround coming back from Africa, but um, now the boys are pretty primed and ready to go. Pierre's Francis. Kick-off is at 25-8. to 8. Meanwhile, the Highlanders co-captain Shane Christie has been ruled out of the rest of the season because of mysterious concussion-like symptoms. That's the news. Tomorrow morning, rock star astrophysicist Dr Neil deGrasse Tyson explains how he got starstruck. I'll talk to both Jason Donovan and Ryan Adams not at the same time, because that would be weird. Anthropologist Dr Michael Jackson on how Africa changed him. And rugby coach Wayne Smith on his involvement with the Ride of the Legends cycle tour. Join me tomorrow morning from 8 on RNZ National. It's service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland and Auckland, a few showers turning to rain for a time overnight. Coromandel, Bay of Plenty, Waikato, Waitomo, Taumaranui, Taupo and Taranaki. A few showers, periods of rain tomorrow, heavy at times with possible thunderstorms about Coromandel and Bay of Plenty, easing to isolated showers from afternoon. Whanganui and Taihepe to Wellington, also Gisborne and to Wairarapa, mainly fine today, occasional rain tomorrow, possibly heavy. 
Marlborough, Nelson and Buller rain with some heavy falls, spreading east by evening, clearing tomorrow afternoon. Westland, fine apart from overnight rain. Canterbury and Otago, high cloud today with patchy rain this evening. Rain spreading north tomorrow, easing late morning or afternoon. Southland and Fiordland, occasional rain heavy in Fiordland, clearing early tomorrow and fine spells increasing. The Chatham Islands, fine spells today and a few showers tomorrow. It's just gone eight past six and you're listening to Checkpoint. Between the disorder and the MMR vaccine, the vaccination debate was reignited after Northland Dr Lance O'Sullivan stormed the stage of controversial film Vaxxed in Kaitaia on Monday night. Figures obtained by Checkpoint from ESR Today show of the 101 cases of measles notified between January and September last year, 78 patients were not vaccinated. And Dr O'Sullivan, backed by Autism, Autism New Zealand, the Health Minister Jonathan Coleman and the New Zealand Medical Association says anti-vaccine advocates only need to look a dying child in the eyes to see how important vaccinations are. In a moment we'll hear from him but first here's what those attending a screening of Vaxxed in the Northland town of Mongatoroto last night had to say to our reporter Zach Fleming. I've never seen any good science indicating that vaccines are actually beneficial um, and to some extent I think that they're a little bit of a marketing exercise on behalf of Big Pharma. So. But the world was once inundated with smallpox and polio it and was. now both have it almost was. been the, the, eliminated. The big, the big question is whether or not that was caused by improved hygiene and improved uh, nutrition and improved living standards. This whole thing of vaccination is... When you talk to my friends in, in natural health, we always come up to the whole thing that it's brainwashing. It's like all of society is brainwashed. The heavy metals, the preservatives, the... Um, DNA from aborted fetuses that are used and that are made, that you have to carry the virus into the body on, I kind of find it morally unacceptable, um, even if there is some medical benefits to it. If the people who are so fearful of catching things, who are vaccinated, are that fearful and they have such trust that they'll work, what have they got to fear? In fact, the people they don't like who they say aren't vaccinated, well, won't they just die of things and they won't be there anyway, so the problem's gone? So, I mean, what have they got to, what, what's the, what, that's not a good argument. Because some people can't be vaccinated because their immune systems aren't good enough, so they say that we should vaccinate ourselves to protect them. Thank you very much. Well, we live on a planet where shit happens. Zach Fleming put those responses this afternoon to the man who has become the face of the debate, Dr Lance O'Sullivan. Oh, that shit happens, um, brainwashing, what the f Excuse my language. What do you think when you listen to that? Oh, look, I'm not surprised, actually. I mean, those arguments, they're, they're flaky, they're paper thin in terms of... It's, it's basically emotion and irrational thought. There's no reasoning there. I mean, the idea of Big Pharma, you know, this conspiracy, and this is what they always talk about, anti-vaxxers. They always talk about Big Pharma being, you know, uh, where everyone's in the pockets of Big Pharma. It's all about profits. And that, that is such a common and rolled-out... Uh, reason, uh, you know, for us to reject immunisations, it's just, it's just not funny. It's stupid. I, I heard um, you. I heard you snigger when he when he said about the aborted fetuses thing. Oh yeah, I mean, look, that's that's actually disgraceful and offensive that they would suggest. You know that we're doing this. You know that we, the medical establishment. I mean, you know, I, I just I think that it's, it, again, it just goes to show how 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 ludicrous this argument is and these people that are, are driving the argument. So, yep, definitely, uh, I would say that's a pretty offensive thing to say to, you know, um, I mean, it, yeah, so that's that. Yep. Yeah. And then I guess you, you're on the front line. You see these these kids come in with yep. measles, mumps or rubella or, or, or whatever it is and you yep. see how ill they are and how much pain they're in. What, is, what does it feel like for you to hear someone say shit happens in response oh. to that? To hear someone say... That, hey, look, we live on a world and a planet where shit happens. I mean, like, that, that is just so, that's just so idiotic. I mean, you know, come into, come into my car, come into my community, or go to a community anywhere in New Zealand, go face, go face the parent of a child who's died from meningitis or from pneumonia or from whooping cough, 
and you tell them that shit happens. And let's see how far, how long you last in their house. Yep. You, you knowing that this is what you're up against in your in your battle. Yep. How does how do you feel? Do, do you feel like you can change their opinion? You know, <clears throat> you know it's interesting. Um, there is only a very small group of hardcore anti-vaxxers in this country, to be honest, Zach. Yeah. And uh, and I really don't give two shits about them. Um, it's the people that. Uh, 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 sitting on the fence that I believe are, are decent people who make rational um, choices that are, you know, unfortunately getting misled by these people. That's who I care about. I, I have well, these I have these stats here, which is yeah. kind of the, the real world effect of, of these opinions. Yeah. So we've yeah. got um, last year alone 1735, so 1735 notifications of uh, pre- immunization preventable diseases and yep. 651 of those were for people under 19 the vast majority is yep. for whooping cough yep. 1100 yep. of that does oh my that, gosh does that surprise you no oh, look um yeah i mean i'm i'm really disappointed to hear that i mean if you've ever seen a child who's struggling with whooping cough it is so incredibly frightening you know i mean they're looking at you with their eyes are in fear like they, you can you can see a, a six-week-old who, who really has no idea of six, what the big Six world weeks like. old. Yep, you can you can see these these six weeks, six months, you know, with this um, amazing sense of fear in the eyes, and they know they haven't even had a chance to really discover what the world's like. But they one thing that's real fast is fear, you know, and um, yeah, that's awful. Uh, I, I it's sort of painful to hear, you know, that we have all these conditions happening and um yeah I've, I've, uh, you know we've tried to help kids you know and um and doctors around the country have tried to save kids and they've lost that battle who have got vaccine preventable diseases um you know these these, these people this this group who are in my opinion a very unpleasant group of new zealanders and people from offshore uh you know i you stand over the graves of these children. You stand at the end of the beds of these intensive care units of these children, um, and, and and let's see how how you feel about shit happening then. He's part of the president's inner circle. Now U.S. media is reporting Donald Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor Jared Kushner is under FBI scrutiny as part of the Russia investigation. Reports say investigators believe he has relevant information, but he's not necessarily suspected of a crime. The FBI is looking into potential Russian meddling in the presidential election and links with Mr Trump's campaign. Mr Trump has described the situation as the single greatest witch hunt of a politician in American history. But Mr Kushner's lawyer says his client will cooperate with any inquiry, as Washington Post's Matt Zabotowski reports. We hinted last week that this was a senior official very close to the president, and and now we're revealing it can almost get no closer. It's Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and a top White House advisor. We think that's you know really significant. We uh, I should clarify that we're not saying that they know he has done wrong, that they're ready to charge him or anything like that. Just that the FBI, uh, the special counsel, is is seriously looking into Jared Kushner. He had some meetings in December with the Russian ambassador and a banker from Moscow, and they're at the, these meetings are at the centre of the investigation? He did, yes. So in very early December, he met with um, Sergei Kislyak, who uh, is the Russian ambassador to the United States, and then later sent a deputy to meet with Sergei Kislyak. He also met that month with a guy named Sergei Gorkov, who's the head of a, a big bank in Russia. Well, you know, it would not be unheard of for um, members of the incoming administration, of which Jared Kushner was, uh, to meet with uh, emissaries of foreign countries. But that, that was a little weird because of the U.S.'s relationship with Russia, one, and because of what Russia had done with regard to our election, two. So investigators are keenly interested in these meetings as part of a, a much broader probe into um, Russian meddling in the 2016 election and possibly other stuff, too. And how much do you know about those meetings themselves and what they talked about? 
Well, we would like to know a lot more than we do. The White House uh, has characterized these as just sort of routine diplomatic courtesies, nothing of substance. I don't know that we've seen sort of formal readouts from them, though. And interestingly, the White House didn't disclose these in real time. It wasn't until some time later. And, and our colleagues at the, the New York Times out here reported that um, Jared Kushner had actually omitted these meetings from a security clearance form. You're supposed to list your contacts with um, members of foreign governments, and he, he had left those off. His lawyer says that was sort of innocent mistake, but that's another interesting dynamic here. And as you say in your, your story today, the former national security adviser, Michael Flynn, who we already know as being investigated, he was also at one of those meetings? He was. He was at the early December meeting, and then later that month, he is on a, a very controversial call with Sergei Kislyak, where they discuss uh, the U.S. imposed sanctions against Russia. That violates, uh, or potentially violates, uh, an almost never used U.S. statute about sort of undercutting um, the current administration on foreign policy. But even more interesting, uh, interestingly than that, um, uh, Michael Flynn doesn't tell the vice president even about the substance of this conversation. He's later uh, ousted from his position as national security advisor because of that. So again, just another interesting dynamic here. So how significant is this development, this revelation about Jared Kushner today? He, he, as you say, he's not suspected of any crime. Right. I would say it is significant uh, because of who he is, because of his role in the White House, because of his closeness with the president. It's interesting to know that FBI investigators are interested in him. But I would, I would definitely say that it stops short of saying he is thought to have done wrong. We, we are not reporting that. It is not to that, to that level of significance yet. And as you say, he's an important person. He's a unique figure inside the White House. He is. I mean, he is married to the president's daughter. In fact, the, probably the only person closer to the president than him is the president's daughter, Ivanka. He is just a critical figure and a unique figure in that he's kind of deputized to be the point person on all sorts of foreign policy. So this is not some low-level guy or some guy who can sort of be thrown out easily. This is a blood family to the president and someone who plays a key role in the White House now. And are any other White House officials being investigated at this stage? He is the only current White House official that we know of that is a focus of investigators' attention. Of course, Mike Flynn did play a key role in the White House. He was the national security advisor, but he's no longer there. Paul Manafort is another person we know investigators are keenly interested in. He was a key player on the campaign. He was actually Trump's campaign chairman, but he was kind of a short timer there, was ousted pretty quickly. So Kushner is the only current White House official that we know to be considered kind of a key person here in the probe. And Matt, what's next? Is, I mean, is there more to come? That's a great question. So um, a special counsel has been appointed. Bob Mueller, uh, who is a former FBI director, is now leading this investigation. Uh, we understand that the investigation is really heating up with some subpoenas being issued for records and possibly some interview requests coming. So we'll just watch closely to see what of those steps become public and see where this thing leads. We don't know yet. You know, I don't want to overstate the significance here. We're not saying that wrongdoing has been proven. We'll just watch closely to see what more they find. It's Matt Zapatoski from the Washington Post. They've been dubbed the Dirty 30 and the Christchurch City Council wants to name and shame the owners of these 30 derelict CBD properties in a bid to force them to repair or replace their quake damaged buildings. But as Logan Church reports, some buildings have been mistakenly added to the hit list while some owners say they're just being bullied. Councillor Jamie Goff is pushing for the owners of 30 derelict buildings, which he calls the Dirty 30, to be shamed publicly and forced to repair or replace their earthquake damaged buildings. Some people feel that they're being threatened by the council. Good, they are being threatened by the council. If they have genuinely got an insurance payout and they can't be bothered contributing to the rebuild, I hope they feel threatened because they deserve to be. They're actually letting our entire city down and most people really want to see the city rebuilt well and most people are actually doing their fair share of it. At a meeting yesterday, the council agreed to target the owners of buildings which it believes are hindering the city's rebuild. 
but some feel they are being treated unfairly. The Christchurch Heritage Trust owns the Trinity Church and Shands Emporium on Manchester Street. Its chairperson, Anna Crichton, says those buildings have been almost completely restored and she doesn't understand why they are on the list. I feel not only let down, but I feel insulted. We are a small, private, charitable trust doing our best. If they had come and talked to us and even looked at what we were doing, that there's no way those buildings would have been on that list. Anna Crichton says the trust received a letter from the council 10 days ago, threatening increased fees for encroaching onto the pavement, legal action and media coverage. RNZ News has obtained a copy of the letter, and in it the council's head of urban design, regeneration and heritage, Carolyn Ingalls, says their buildings are undermining confidence in the central city. But the council's strategy general manager, Brendan Anstis, maintains the letter is not aggressive. The letter's not threatening, so um, suggestions that the kind of letter um, uh, calls building owners stubborn um, are simply incorrect, so uh, that's not in the letter. Um, so I know that the media has portrayed that being in the letter. Um, I can categorically say that's not in the letter. OK, so you would categorically say that this letter is in no way at all threatening? Uh, what I can tell you is that the letter is factually correct. Brendan Anstis says every property on the list deserves to be there. He says the council will work with owners to ensure they are repairing, restoring or rebuilding their properties. But councillor Jamie Goff says some properties, including the Heritage Trust buildings, shouldn't have been on the list when it was released. There were a couple of examples that probably didn't have um, the correct context around it. With that context, I give uh, those property owners my word that we're not going to be pursuing them, and we've had that conversation with, with council staff. It was a mistake, I think. But Jamie Goff believes the letter's wording is justified. If these handful of absentee slum landlords were only doing detriment to themselves, I'd be all right with that, but they're not. So the fact that the letter is hard-hitting, the fact that the letter for some of these landowners feels like they're being threatened, I think is a fantastic thing. Jamie Goff says he has apologised to Anna Crichton and is working to get the Heritage Trust's two buildings off the list. In Autotahi for Checkpoint, call Logan Church Tene. A police plan to pay people to dob in those selling booze and cigarettes stolen in armed hold-ups is picked as doomed to fail. The police are running a month-long campaign as they try to track, crack down on violent crimes in some communities across the country, particularly South Auckland. Eva Corlett reports. The police are running the campaign through the Crime Stoppers line, offering a reward to people who provide information that leads to a successful prosecution. The police commissioner, Mike Bush, says the scheme is another tool to curtail violent crime against dairy owners. We're aware of the fact that some of these robberies, or a lot of these robberies, are to order. So there are people out there trading in the black market in terms of what's stolen. We want to stop that and we want people to come forward who have got information that will help us prosecute those people that are trading in the black market. And that's why we're working together with Crime Stoppers and we've offered a reward. Mr Bush says the reward would be several thousand dollars, depending on the level of information. He says the anonymity and safety of people who come forward would be paramount. We've even had parents come forward and front their uh, young people at the station and say, look, we, we're not tolerating this behaviour, here they are. That's fantastic and we uh, acknowledge their bravery and courage for doing that. But whether other people need some other incentive to do that, we'll provide that as well because we really want to stop this. We really feel for those uh, victims in these shops. We're turning up the heat, uh, we'll step up the game until we turn this around. Mr Bush says offenders will not be rewarded if they come forward. The spokesperson for the crime prevention group, Sunny Kaushal, says the police are starting to take dairy owners' concerns seriously by offering up rewards, creating a special task force and putting highly visible officers on the streets. Many of the members in the public, they know, uh, you know where to get those cigarettes at cheaper rates or uh, some of those black marketeers. But the reward uh, linked to uh, the information would certainly help uh, in getting into that underbelly. But Victoria University criminologist Dr Trevor Brandley says a lot of people close to the crime are unlikely to tell the police about it. Types of people that have the information uh, that police are interested in are usually involved in pretty tight-knit relationships with 
the people the police are interested in. So they are reluctant for that reason to divulge any information that might damage them. While they may not have been involved in the particular incident, they could have been involved in other incidents. And so them giving information on uh, some of their uh, associates might simply backfire on them. He says that some people are afraid of dobbing in an offender. More generally, of course, is the psychological impact of being outed as a grass or a, a police narc or a, an informant. And, you know, among uh, some sectors of the community, that's the kind of lowest of the low. And it's a, a very difficult label to deal with and one that's very difficult to shrug off. Dr Bradley says a reward would need to be significant to compel people to come forward. Aucklanders were asked if they thought rewards would be effective. I don't know about trust in New Zealand police. It could divulge your name to somebody. So you'd be worried about safety if you were, if you were to put your name forward that you might then get in trouble as well? Yeah. I mean, I've dialed 111 over incidents and uh, the name got, got to the bloke who he's shot two people. I don't trust the police to keep it quiet. I think people will give information if their conscience is decent enough to... I don't think someone should be given a reward. It gives people an incentive to only do good thing for a reward. If it's an alliance type thing, I feel like a reward is going to be less than that connection with someone. The police say the reward campaign will run until the end of June. I tāmaki makaurau mo te hōtaka o te ahiahi, ko Eva Colette tēnei. And there's been lots of feedback today about uh, the vaccination debate. This one from Chris. I cannot believe that this is still an issue in the 21st century. Anyone who has ever seen a child with polio or mentally affected by measles would not hesitate to have their child vaccinated. How do these anti-vaxxers think that smallpox, smallpox was eliminated? And this one, interesting stats on vaccinations. I would have given my baby the whooping cough and measles vaccines, but it is not possible to just get singles. It was all or nothing, which was unacceptable to me, so I didn't get any. I was even willing to pay. We should be given a choice. And that's Checkpoint for this evening. Thanks for joining us on your radio, your television, online, or however you chose to connect with us today. You can hear highlights on Late Edition at 10.15 this evening or any of our stories tonight on rnz.co.nz slash checkpoint. And for all the latest news, information, feature stories from New Zealand and around the world, go to the rnz.co.nz homepage. So from me, Sharon Brett-Kelly and the Checkpoint team, have a great night. RNZ News Headlines at 6.30. Parliament has passed its budget centrepiece legislation, the Families Income Package, under urgency. The Finance Minister has intimated the government may revisit tax cuts before the election. A law expert says keeping a ban on prisoner voting is inconsistent with the Bill of Rights because all New Zealanders are entitled the right to vote. A teenager who stabbed a West Auckland dairy owner to death has been released from a youth justice facility with the parole board saying it no longer needs to monitor him. An overcrowded Tauranga school has been told a long-planned rebuild was an education ministry mistake. The school's board of trustees chair says it's a mystery when the ministry's own figures show more classrooms are desperately needed. The Pentagon has confirmed that 105 Iraqi civilians were killed in an American airstrike in the besieged city of Mosul in March.